اوكي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والسلام على سيدنا محمد المصطفى وعلى اله الشرفاء واصحابه اهل الصدق والوفاء اما بعد uh, respected chair distinguished Başka, panelist sayın panelistler okay uh, okay this distinguished uh, speakers buyurun efendim başlayın Okay, I'll Siz wait başlayın. For it. Okay, can I start? Başlayabilir miyiz? Yes, sure, please. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Um, the abstract is that you know this what we are discussing is much of what uh, Professor Oseni has mentioned is. I'm echoing some of these issues he has raised in his excellently presented uh, keynote address. And my my issue here is I'm taking this to the next level of discussion. That is by, you know, introducing that this topic. That is, you know, October 7, uh, 2023 is touted as the 9-11 moment for, uh, of Israel. In both these incidents, the lives lost were negligent as compared to the resultant campaign of disproportionate terror unleashed by both America and the Zionist usurper Israel, with their subservient backers in the West, killing, maiming, and displacing many thousands of innocent Muslims across the world, particularly countries like Palestine, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Syria, India, Myanmar, Sudan, Somalia, and of course, Yemen. Crimes against humanity committed by these vile forces are so horrendous that it defies all standards of uh, decency, morality, legality, uh, and legality with total impunity. None of those who perpetuated these savageries, carnages, and mayhems were brought to justice by any court of law, let alone the so-called international criminal or court of justice that holds the bragging rights to go after leaders of independent countries who stood to defer and challenge the hegemony of world arrogance that is hiding behind democracy and rule of law. It is now evident without any shred of doubt that these two carnages and many more were committed with full knowledge of their respective intelligence institutions who were complicit in one way or the other for the occurrence of these events in pursuit of their own self-interest. Mounting proofs have been established by fair-minded and humanly conscious people were deliberately discarded and discredited while they were silenced and sidelined by the power of media that is in collusion with this. International institutions were prostituted and pro proscribed for, uh, from taking decisive actions to bring the perpetrators of these crimes to justice. International Court of Justice and International Criminal Court have been rendered clueless, gutless, toothless and worthless by the recalcitrant attitude of the powerful countries. Even those who have some humanity in them were ridiculed and condemned by the world hegemon and its lieutenants by demanding their resignation for stating the obvious truth. So with this introduction, my paper will cover the uh, following item. That's that I will be discussing on Sharia, understanding its unity within diver its diversity, International Court of Justice, the genesis, ideals and realities, and then towards an international Islamic Court of Justice, a uh, Makassidic uh, framework, how you know, that had been done, then I will be going for the conclusion. Now we talk about understanding, you know, uh, the, this is an issue where we have to be very uh, passionate about because it is here we have not seen eye to eye among our brothers. So we be begin to look down on other madhabs and all this thing. So what I would say is that, that since all, we need to have uh, some commonality of identity that is called Islamic orthodoxy that includes the the four uh, Ahlul Sunnah uh, Madhab there along with Zaydis, Imamis, Ibadis and some moderate uh, Is Ismailis because all of us are converging on the same source that is the uh, Sharia which is composed of Quran and Sunnah. Okay, so since the, the, our point of agreement should be on these three uh, aspects that is the one the oneness of uh, God, the finality of the prophethood, and the uh, eschatology. So if these three things are, are no, uh, agreeable, I think there should not be any issue in conversion because we are looking into the peripheral issues and forgetting the, the central issue which bond us together. 
So that, I think, will be the first one. Now we look into International Court of Justice, Genesis, Ideals and Realities. As you can see from this, uh, this one, it started in uh, what you call the IIC. IIC started in 1919 with the Paris Peace Conference proposed to International Criminal Court to prosecute political leaders and other individuals accused of international crimes. And then it proceeded up to that. And now it was what you call... Uh, um, in 1994, final draft of the International Criminal Court presented to the General Assembly and the Rome Statutes uh, uh, was duly adopted. Following 60 ratification, these, uh, the Rome Statute came into force uh, in 2002, thereby formally establishing the International Criminal Court. Ever since the coming into existence of this criminal court, they were only, uh, what do you call, penalizing or bringing the uh, uh, people to, to the court. It's not the people actually perpetrated the crime, those who have, you know, the uh, people who are on the peripheral of the issue. But the, so far, those who have committed the crimes have not been brought to justice. Particularly like people like Mr. Bush, Mr. Blair and all these people, they are going scot-free and uh, lecturing the world on how the world should be run. So this is not, that has you know disadvantage that has put this institution into uh, what you call questionable uh, as to its uh, real function and its uh, intent. Because it seems that they are uh, out there to punish those who are uh, lesser powerful ones. That it is not the... Uh, it's not the right uh, right thing to do because we feel that the justice should uh, be seen uh, done and not just uh, preached. So what is happening in the International Court of Justice is it's a selected few of individuals who have sitting there and passing judgment on third world countries. But the real perpetrators of crimes in the West, they have gone scot-free, except for the case in Bosnia, where they have punished the, what do you call, the, uh, the Serbians, uh, generals and all these people. But what they have failed to do also, they have not brought to justice those people who witnessed the crime committed against the uh, poor Bosnians in uh, uh, Srebrenica. And they are, they, are, they are particularly the people in Hague. Dutch, Dutch military generals were witnessing the uh, slaughter of innocent people. So I think that that itself is a root cause why there is a need for Muslims to have their own uh, the International Court of Justice. In that, as you can see this in this uh, slide, there are two, uh, that is, two, two courts were there, International Criminal Court, another one is International Court of Justice. One was established in 1946 and the other one was in 2002. So they have placed it in Hague. Um, but the people from there is the one who witnessed the crime against, committed against the Bosnians. And then you can see all this uh, thing has been, uh, you know, uh, which is um, widely available in the internet. Okay, let's go to the next one. And Okay, now why, why is the need for International Islamic uh, Court of Justice? And as uh, Dr. Husseini has mentioned, we for, uh, Muslim for, uh, form one-fourth of the world population with 2.2 billion people, nearly 60 independent Muslim states with significant population of Muslims living as minority uh, um, uh, in many non-Muslim countries. Human rights laws provide space for Muslims to exercise their freedom of freedom to express their religious rights. In many cases referred to ICJ, Muslims, con Muslims' concerns were not given a fair hearing due to lack of expertise in interpreting Islamic law within the context of uh, international law. Okay, excellent. Okay, this is the trajectory of uh, what they call progress we have made. Uh, we have made in establishing the International Islamic Court of Justice, as the Professor Dr. Husseini has uh, um, ably uh, covered the whole thing. But I, I, as you can see, that by 1987, this the whole thing was uh, the effort was postponed because of they are waiting to ratify, and that ratification process is still taking long. And that, that's the problem which is uh, causing the delay in establishing this uh, an, uh, International Court of Justice. Because uh, Islamic, uh, International Islamic Court of Justice has uh, been uh, uh, what uh, the origin has gone back in 1972. But up till now, it has not come into fruition because of the internal uh, instability and the unwillingness on the part of the leadership. 
to ensure that justice is delivered. Because many of these the leaders are themselves, you know, um, uh, culpable, and they are also involved in a lot of crimes against their own Muslim uh, population. So they natural, naturally they will not be willing to do uh, see justice done. So that needs to be addressed because they are the um, stumbling block in ensuring that Islamic International Islamic Court of Justice is not, uh, you know, uh, not uh, uh, established because they have to hold themselves accountable accountable for what they have done. Okay, then let's go into the next one. So this is my proposal. Even though the Islamic Court of Justice has been there, but I feel that it is not, uh, you know, we need to have two uh, uh, aspects. That is, the Islamic uh, Islamic Court of Justice must have Muslim majority states uh, 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 and also Muslim minority states. Because we have got increasing number of Muslims are migrating to minority countries to, um, to uh, stay away from persecution and all kind of things happening within the Muslim country. So they have already... Um, uh, uh, a large portion of Muslims are already settled there and they also need to be, uh, their problems need to be addressed. So I feel that by next year, I, I, I hope we will have both these things will be established. And also we need to have these three languages as what they call the language of the court, that is Arabic, English and French. And relationship, uh, what they call uh, with the United Nations, I, I feel that United Nations which should also hold uh, some kind of uh, 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 we should be involved with the United Nations, one, but on condition that uh, the uh, Muslim country is given a permanent uh, seat. And that must be also with a veto power, because otherwise it will be a total uh, waste of uh, our effort. Because everywhere we are, we are handicapped. We have not been given uh, due, despite having the one fourth of the population, we are denied justice there. And we need to have at least one Muslim country representing the interests of Islam and Muslims at the at the Security Council. Okay, and also this we feel that uh, and uh, we have to drive authorities from uh, Islamic law and Majma al Fakh that is in in Jeddah. And here also we will have Islamic law and uh, all this thing will be done. And. Uh, I propose that it is not also my proposal. I came to know that the idea of establishing the location is will be in Baitul Maqdis. That will be the best place because that's where the justice need to be done. But uh, at, at the moment, we we have we are having a problem at the, due to the the persecution of uh, Palestinians by the brutal uh, Jewish population. So that that can be temporarily housed in Kuwait and in Qatar. Why I choose Qatar? Because Qatar has established itself as a neutral ground and also have uh, successfully defended the the uh, as a being a. People moderating and also mitigating the problem between the parties concerned. They have successfully conducted themselves. And I think that should be the place for listening the problem of Muslim minority states. You know? So then these are the scope of the works you can see, which is uh, which is same as the rest of it. And I propose that there must be five judges knowledgeable in Sharia representing the various madahib. Uh, elected for five-year terms uh, each by a member state. This is for the majority country. Well, this one here, uh, judges also will be knowledgeable in Sharia and international law elected for, in, you know, and from different nations, okay? And the funding is concerned. I say that we need to get funding from the Islamic uh, Fiqh Academy. They have got a waqaf fund. And that should be certain funds should be contributed. And also voluntary contribution from the Muslim individuals, cooperation, uh, especially from Muslim majority country. And as for the minority one, waqaf, uh, there must be some kind of a world waqaf fund. And also a crowdfunding on the basis of case-to-case -case basis and voluntary contribution from individual cooperation, uh, etc., from Muslim minority countries. And this all is there. So I'm uh, I'm proposing some kind of a um, uh, you know a probably, uh, approximate uh, budget for uh, starting this uh, project. Okay, next. All right, this is the core issue of the Makassidic framework, because whether it is human rights or whatever modern issues, that should be well, that should fit within the structure of the Makassid. So if you look into it, the re religion is not one item uh, separate from the rest of the Makassid. It is every decision a Muslim makes is pertaining to his religion, whether it's pertaining to nafs, uh, that is uh, life, intellect, or uh, nasl, or ird, 
or mal it's all pertaining to our relation with uh, religion so i have excluded the religion and put it in the central theme of our uh, what do you call maqasid so uh, in fact if you look into the urd the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had to uh, what do you call expel the jews because of disparaging the dignity of a muslim so that was a case of uh, ird what what is what we have failed to do in so far is that in discussing this maqasid we have overlooked ird and put it under the nasl so as a result what happened uh, what is happening in uh, in all kind of uh, crimes against muslim is they were targeting the dignity of muslim ummah and muslim women and all this people so that that needs to be given its due recognition and that is a serious issue so i feel that in in uh, maqasid we have to ensure that two aspects must be there that is the hifz the protection and the preservation and that should be we have to uh, detail out all the laws in light of this structure and said the the issue of a commission omission and this should be applied to both you know both uh, muslim majority and minority situation and then next one please okay the conclude the way forward will be first to have at least one seat for oic as a permanent member with veto power in un second oic will decide which muslim country will represent at un that's a position and also we want to ensure that a military union amongst muslim countries that is based on an attack on one is an attack on all is necessary because we thought military uh, power when uh, we will not be getting the the justice okay strong financial contribution to international islamic uh, what they call court of justice through member contribution by expanding the uh, islamic fiqh uh, academy waqf and providing legal expert training to muslims on international administration of justice and also exposing the fuqaha to contemporary geopolitical geoeconomic and geostrategic realities and i am dedicating this uh, presentation to the thousands of um, uh, lost life in gaza assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh